So if you remember last week, we looked at the idea of being both God's field and the laborers in God's field, right? So it says that the Bible tells us that when we believe in Christ, we're given the right to become children of God, and God expects his children to work, right? He's got work to do, and he chose you and me to do it. We talked about the idea that God could have chosen to do it himself. He could have chosen through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God could have chosen to do all the work he expects done on this earth himself, so we can sit back and watch. We can sit back and look at how glorified our God is, how amazing our God is, but he chose his people, his children, to do the work. But he says, you work, I bring the growth. So he doesn't expect you to bring growth. He knows you can't. And he doesn't expect you to work alone. He's there with you. He says we are co-laborers with Christ. So that's where we left off last week. Now, Paul picks up here talking about that very work that we do. See, something that's interesting, in verse 10, Paul says that he laid the foundation as a master builder and that others are building upon. Now, here he's talking about kind of two things, both the foundation that he's talking about is both the foundation of the very church that he planted, so this church in Corinth he planted, and then Apollos, right, the great speaker Apollos, came and helped build that church. And so he's saying the foundation, the church is the foundation I laid, but he's really saying that there's really one true foundation, and that foundation is Christ. And he says that right away so that no one's confused about what that foundation is. He says, right, he immediately tells them Christ is the one and only true foundation. One thing that's interesting to me is he calls himself a master builder, a skilled master builder. And I looked at that and I wondered, you know, Paul is this guy who said some bold things, right? God chose to speak through him into the word. And he said some bold things like, follow me as I follow Christ. I can't imagine saying that in my life. Paul said some bold things. Now, this one I thought, man, is this one of those things? Where he's saying, like a master builder, I laid a foundation. And then you look at this word master, and this word is also the word wise. Like a wise builder. And I thought, hmm. He's saying he's a wise builder, not because he is something great, but because the wisdom is, the foundation is only Christ. And so if you lay a foundation of Christ... You can also be a skilled master builder. And so this is one of those things, not that Paul is saying that we can aspire to one day in our life, follow me as I follow Christ. This is something we should be able to say in our very lives. That we, like skilled master builders, we, like wise builders, laid a foundation, that foundation is Christ. And see... Calling himself this wise builder really plays on the same thing he's been talking about in this, in this letter to the church in Corinth. And that is that true wisdom is only found in Christ. So here's to reminding people that only wise and true foundations for their church are built on Christ. And we know that these times, right, the people in the church in Corinth, they were really seeking wisdom. But more than that, they're seeking knowledge and they wanted to really align themselves with one of the well-known teachers, preachers, leaders of the time. He, they would align themselves to Paul if they thought Paul would make them look best. Right? Paul was a foundation layer. Paul started the church. We saw that some would appoint themselves with, man, I am, I'm like one of Apollos, the great speaker Apollos. Some people think that Apollos wrote um, Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews for sure, but it's an incredibly well-written book. Some people associate that with Apollos because he was such a, such a great speaker. Some people are like, no, we're with Peter, right? Because didn't Jesus say, Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build the church. And people think that that meant that Peter was the rock of the church or something. And, and so they're, they just want to look good. They want to seek after earthly wisdom. But Paul is telling them, listen, there's only true wisdom found in Christ. He says that Listen, I, I, Paul, I planted Apollos, water, but all that we're doing is we're just leaders on the same path to bring God glory, help the church grow. They're on the same purpose. And it's like you said, you see there at the end of chapter 3, he says, all those leaders are just people seeking to help the church, right? They are the church's leaders, it says. It says whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life, he's saying all these things are for the church. 
and the church is Christ's, and Christ is God. So he was reminding them that all these things exist for the purpose of bringing God glory. That's what he's saying. Now, here's something we need to see. The idea that Christ is the only true foundation really should permeate everything about our lives. And we think of that maybe as just our, the foundation of our salvation. We think of it as the foundation of maybe just the church. And we'll segregate those things as if they're separate from other parts of our life. But if I were to ask you the question, for those of you that do, if I were to say something like, hey, why do you serve in Sunday school? For those of you who serve in Sunday school. You probably have a good kind of Jesus-y answer, right? You say, oh, you know, I just want to serve the church and serve God through using the gifts he's given me. And help the church or help the Lord and what he's called me to do. You, you give a good, solid Bible answer to that. But what if I asked you, why do you go to work? Why do you have a job? You'd likely have a different type of answer, wouldn't you? Maybe you would say something like, hey, I need to provide for my family. It's important. You might say, I really enjoy this career field. It's something I, I love doing, and so I get to do something I love. Maybe it's you're trying to um, just be an important person in your community. Maybe you're trying to get up in this business so you can be kind of a big wig. Or maybe you're trying to get wealthy. You're trying to get famous. I don't know. But you have Probably you would have a different answer than why you serve in your church. And let me tell you, you shouldn't. Because those are good secondary reasons. A lot of those, maybe not all of them, but many of those are actually really good secondary reasons for going to work every day. They are. But we need to realize that Christ is the foundation for all we do. Everything we do. That means that the reason that you should do anything including the reason that you should get up and go to work, is to bring God glory by following his will in your life. Everything you should do should pass through that filter first. Now, let me tell you, God is a pretty amazing God, and he might have called you to do some of those very things. I can tell you that he's probably called you to financially provide for your family. He's probably called you to do a good work. He actually loves to bless you in your work, too. And so he may want to see you enjoy your job. God loves it when we enjoy it. He blesses us by enjoying things. He, he enjoys for us to get to go spend time with our friends and family, enjoy the work we do, hang out, have fun. Those are good blessings from God. But everything we should do in our life should go through that idea of Christ is the foundation. And so the answer to why you go to work should be, I go to work to glorify God because that is his will in my life. And he has called me to work to both maybe witness to the people around me, maybe provide for my family, maybe to make a difference in my community, whatever the case may be. But it starts with to bring God glory because Christ should be the foundation of not just our church but our very life. We are the church, right? And he calls us to do a lot of things, but I think we need to check the purpose of how and why we spend time in our lives the way we do. Because like I said, I absolutely believe that he calls us to do great things. And sometimes he blesses us. He wants us to enjoy our life. He's pleased when we have fun, when we do things. Sometimes you going out to the movies with your friends is exactly what God would want you to do. Because he wants to bless you with that time and that fellowship and to have fun. God may dir directly have you in the job that he has you in. But I'm telling you, we should think about the reason. Because I, I feel like maybe oftentimes it gets misguided. As believers, we sometimes forget our first love, don't we? Christ. You know, it reminds me of that idea that we see uh, the letter to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation chapter 2, right? It says this. Listen to this. I read this. Um, Jared was pointing this out to me, and I was like, oh, man, it was good. This is the letter to the church in Corinth in Revelations 2. It says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Right? That's the beginning. Those are good things. Right? I know that... You, you, 
you have tested the truth and you want what's true and you've been patient and endured through all these years. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's saying, listen to this church in, Cor in Ephesus. He's saying, Man, I understand that you're people that have faithfully known what God's call and truth is. And so you have sought the truth and you've been able to discern the false prophets from the true prophets. You have been able to discern the true teachings from the false truth and you have endured faithfully. However, you forgot your first love. Serve me the way you once served me. Do the things you once did. Because guess what? I can remove your lampstand from its place. You know what that lampstand is? Lampstand is the church. That church. He says, I can take that church. I can take it away. I can put those people somewhere else. And I thought, hmm. And what a good word sometimes for our life. Yeah, we, we can know the truth and we can desire the truth of God in our life and we will faithfully do some things like come to church and have our Bible studies in the mornings at our quiet times. But as I was kind of thinking about this church, I, I've been excited just meeting with people and talking through how everyone is excited to see this church really make a difference in the community and reach the lost and to grow and develop believers. And I thought, man, this, is, this church has done that very thing really well over the years really well. I don't run into many people who don't know about Angus Church in the city. Everyone knows who Angus Church is in the city. It's pretty incredible. Many of those people have come and gone through this church or have been to something at this church. We were meeting with, a, uh, Jared and I were meeting with a bunch of uh, pastors and leaders in the community and uh, talking about the churches and, and all the just amazing things God's doing in this city. And we were talking to the mayor and realized, I think Angus Church is the largest church building in the city. I don't know if that's right, but when talking to the mayor, he said, yeah, I think you guys have the largest sanctuary of any church in this city. And I thought, hmm, it's probably that way for a reason. We needed it to fill the people. But I thought, hmm, what did it the first time? What was it that made this church really grow and develop? What made it to where we needed a sanctuary bigger than any other sanctuary in this city? And is, it, is that the first love of Christ that we've forgotten, maybe? Maybe not. But what did we do at first that we can do again? It really stuck out to, stood out to me, and I thought, huh, there's something there. And maybe it's not just a word for our church. Maybe it's for you personally in your life. Maybe you personally have laid a foundation that isn't Christ. Maybe you're spending your time, your energy, your effort, your resources on things that isn't really aren't the things that God desired you to spend them on, but you've kind of started placing your foundation in yourself and not in Christ. And so you have your own plan and will and way for your life. So that's why you start how you start spending your time, your money, your resources. I thought, man, if we can just get back to that foundation. Because no matter how good the things you may be doing are, or how much good you think those things may be accomplishing, if it's not God's will for your life, then it is like a house built on a sinking foundation. It will not stand. Let me say that one more time. No matter how good the things you may be doing are, or how much good you think they are doing in your life, if that is not God's will for your life, it will not stand. It's like a house built on a sinking foundation. We may think it's a well-built house, but it's got the wrong foundation. You see, and I was talking to a, writing something to an amazing man in this church and about this very idea that's been on my mind all week. That we struggle with good versus good a lot as believers. That's the hard thing as believers. It's Things that both seem like good things. And how do we make decisions on good versus good in our life? And I think one of the things we have to do is we have to realize, are some things good things that we want? And other things are the good things that God wants? 
Man, they can both be good things, but we have to find God's will in our life. Because we can spend our entire life doing good things built on the wrong foundation. And it's going to pass away. Paul continues talking about that very idea. The very work of a believer is building on that foundation, right? You see, once you have the right foundation, the work that you build has a chance to stand. But as Paul points out, some people are not even building with the right materials. Their work will be tested by fire, he says. What he is saying is that while we have life on this earth, the very works we do, right, our life, God will test them in the end. God's going to test the work we do, the things that we build, the way we build on this foundation. And if they are like gold, silver, and precious stones, they're the things God desired for our life. We're going to get to the end of our lives, and we're going to receive a reward for the things we've done. However, if we spend our lives doing the wrong things, maybe even good things that weren't God things, we will see them burnt up in the fire, and we're going to be left empty-handed. It says, we will still get into heaven because of our faith, but we're going to get into heaven smelling like smoke. <laughs> right? And there's some really interesting things and really important things in this passage. First, we see that there's some sort of reward system when we get to heaven. It's kind of hard for us to, to grasp. Now, I can't tell you exactly what that reward system looks like. I can't tell you when we get to heaven what that's like. You know, I studied it. Um, I studied different, I did some different readings and time on it. I talked to some different people. I looked at some, some people smarter than me looking for advice on this. This is what I know. There is a reward from God that is offered to believers when they die. And those rewards, they show the grace and love of God because he bestows them on us. Now, this place, this place, place of judgment that some see, believe the Christians are going to go to, is actually a place that we call the Bema Seat. And let me tell you what the Bema Seat is. Because some people think that believers are going to go to some like place of judgment like everyone else when they die. It's not true. The Bema Seat comes from old Greek games. So there was a guy who sat next to the podium to where they would give the awards, like first, second, third place. The people, the winners would come up and they'd receive their award and they'd get placed up on the podium because of what they did, how well they did. That guy who sat there who did that, his place was called the Bema Seat. It is a receipt, is a place of rewards. And so he rewarded those who did a good job. That is what we face as believers. We're going to get to heaven, and we're going to be in a place of reward before God. Now, we can't lose our salvation, right? Let me tell you, you can't. Believers aren't going to face judgment in the sense that they can lose their salvation, because your salvation is not based on something you did, but something that God did. Your faith in the work of Jesus Christ saved you. Therefore, you can't lose it. It's not in your hands, right? God says that I hold you in my hand and no one can escape my hand. No one can take you from my hand, right? So believers aren't going to face that judgment. However, verse 15 says, those who receive no rewards will be saved, but as through fire. Whew. Now, we are rewarded by God based on our life on earth. Some receive none, some get a lot. There's varying degrees. That's what we see. Now, these rewards are sometimes called crowns. Sometimes we see them called jewels. And let me tell you this. Well, I don't know all the answers, because God doesn't point them out to us as clearly as sometimes I would like in the scriptures. I can tell you this. We want to be people who receive those rewards. We do. God is a great gift giver. And whether they are rewards, rewards that somehow enhance our eternity with him, or they are rewards that we can lay at the feet of Jesus, which is what I believe to be true. I want anything that I could possibly receive in heaven. I think the best thing that we could possibly do with any sort of reward is give it back to God. Whatever that reward system may be that he has in place, we want to be people who receive reward. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. God is a great gift giver. And he created a reward system 
God created it, not me. So I don't think it's wrong to be motivated by that even. And so what we have to do is we have to ask ourselves whether we are actively building on a foundation the way God intends us to. Are we doing the things that God considers to be gold, silver, and precious stones? Things that will actually stand that fire test? Are we seeking God's will in our life, life in a way and ensuring that all the things that we're doing are the things he wants us to do? Or are we just building with straw? Are we building great looking houses out of straw? Are we doing things that are temporary, that are not for the kingdom? Those things that pass away and hold really no eternal value. Let me tell you, I don't want to be the believer who gets into heaven smelling like smoke. I don't want to stand before the Father, my Father, and look back at my life and realize that I've wasted my time on worst, worthless things. I don't want to see them burnt up in front of me. And there's a lot of things that pass away in life, but there's a lot of things that are eternal, and those are the things that God desires for us. I want to make sure that I'm seeking God with how I spend my time, my energy, my resources. You see, everything I have, my gifts, my talents, my abilities, my time, my money, my family, my job, everything I have is an amazing gift God gave me. I am so thankful for everything I have in my life. I have been abundantly blessed. I don't know about you guys, but I have. If you've just met my wife and my kids, you know I have been abundantly blessed. I am so thankful for this church because I know many of you not only have been abundantly blessed, you realize it too. Because God is a good God who loves to bless his children. But he then says, be faithful with what I've given you. And I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your time. Whether that's the relationships you have in your life and how you spend them. The job you have in your life. Is that the job God has for you? Are those relationships God has for you? What are you doing with your time? Because I think God loves his children to enjoy things in life. So I think there's nothing wrong with watching a basketball game or playing a sport or going to the movies or spending time with your friends or Netflix and chilling. But I'm telling you, we should check everything we do through the filter of, is this God's will in our life? Not is it a good thing, is it a God thing? Because Paul warns the church in Corinth, and through that, God is warning us, saying, listen, if you don't check the what you're building what you're building with, the things you do in your life, against whether it's God's will in your life, you're going to get before the Father one day in heaven, and you may see your entire life burnt up before you, and you'll get into heaven, but smelling like smoke, and you'll have no reward. And that's not what God wants for our life. So what an amazing lesson this is for us to say, everything is God's, right? That's what the end of the chapter is. It says that, do you not know that you are God's temple and nothing can destroy God's temple? That is the church, right? I've placed you, I've gifted you, I've done amazing things, but what is the foundation that you've laid? And how are you building on that foundation? Have you forgotten your first love? Have you forgotten the things that you did at first that brought the joy, the growth, the peace, the excitement, the fire of God within your life? Have you forgotten to do those things again? What a great message. Man, I want to celebrate who God is, and I want to do that by bringing glory to his name, by fulfilling his will for my life, every aspect of my life. May it bring glory to his name. You guys with me? Here in just a second, we're going to pray. And let me tell you, you're probably in one of a few places this morning. You may be looking at this passage and saying, Yep, maybe that's me. I haven't really thought about it, but what I've done is I've started building my way with my tools. And man, it's, it's wood, it's hay, it's straw, it's going to be burnt up. And so, God, may you help me build the way you want me to build. May you help me build only upon the foundation that you laid, which is Christ. Let me take myself out of the picture and my worries out of the picture because I know you can take care of anything. May I just... Always seek to bring you glory. God, may I bring you glory through the way I spend time at work, through the way I spend time in my quiet time, for the way I have my relationships, 
for when I'm going out to the movies and for when I'm serving in Sunday school, when I'm mowing somebody's lawn next door because they need it, whatever I do, God, may I do everything because it's what you desire in my life. Because I don't want to get to the end of my life and see it all burnt up. Some people this morning are right, right there. Some of you are looking back <laughs> celebrating that this is a lesson you learned a little bit ago. And you're on fire. And I know there's so many of you. I was with the deacons this morning and I was just looking around that table and I was amazed at the service and the heart of the men sitting at that table this morning. We have a great group of deacons in this church. I was just blown away at the things. I just told you all the things I know that this group of deacons does, not only for this church, but this, for this community. You know that we got a great group of people in this church. So maybe you're one of those and you just get to celebrate this morning. Thank you, God, for giving me all you have. May I just continue to give back to you with my time, my energy, my resources. But then there may be some of you that are even before all that. There may be some of you that say, I have never even laid the foundation of Christ. I have never even put my faith in Christ for salvation. Let me tell you, the Bible says you've got no shot at building until you know Christ. But here's the good news. The good news is you can know him right now. The Bible says that apart from Christ, before we put our faith in Jesus for salvation, we can't know him, we won't spend eternity with him in heaven, and we can't even know the things about him. It even actually gets worse before then because it says you've got no shot on your own because you've messed up and that sin separated you from God. But God knew that and he loved you so much he did something about it. He sent Jesus, the Son of God himself, he died on a cross, rose from the grave to pay for your sins for you. And he didn't ask you to get your life in together before you'll be saved. He says, just trust in me. Put your faith in Jesus, and right now, you're saved. And that is an eternal salvation that no one can take away from you. Because no one can pluck you from God's hand. That is an incredible thing. If you're right there, I ask you, what's keeping you from putting your faith in Christ right now, this morning? What's doing it? Because if it's nothing, today you can know your eternal salvation is set. And you can start building upon the foundation of Christ, seeking his will of your life, and see the amazing blessing it is to live a life for Christ. It's not always easy, but it is such a blessing that God's allowed us to do that. You can do that this morning. In a second, we're about to pray. If you need prayer, come. Jared and I will be up here. If you want prayer for seeking God's will in your life in a difficult situation. You want to help get your foundation set better. You want to just get yourself out of the way. Maybe you want to put your faith in Christ this morning. You don't have to walk up front for those things, but you can. Especially if you want to put your faith in Christ, let somebody know. Because we can start showing you what it looks like to follow him. You'll see that there's a card in front of your seat in front of you that says a visitor card, a prayer card on it. If you're not comfortable walking up or talking to someone, that's okay. But don't leave doing nothing. Put your name on there and what you've done this morning. Let us pray with you. Let us seek you out and help you if we can. But don't do nothing. This morning, let's put our faith in Christ. Whether it's for the first time, whether it's for the 50,000th time, let's say, God, I want my eyes on you and I just want your will is for my life. Can you pray with me?